stand here. Certainly it's great to gather together in the house of the Lord on this Wednesday evening. And uh, I pray that you all have had a great week thus far. And uh, this is just going to be a continuation even this evening. Why don't you lift your hands and let's invite the presence of the Lord into this place tonight. God, we thank you today for your goodness to us. God, for the beautiful day that you've given to us. God, we don't take it for granted that we can gather together with people of like precious faith, that we can join together and worship you in spirit and in truth, O oh God. We ask that your spirit would reign in this house tonight, that there would be a drawing of your spirit in this place tonight. We'll give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. Why don't you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Look at your neighbor. Give them a big smile. Welcome them to Calvary tonight. It's great to have you here. Worship with us as we sing. Oh, we've come to worship you, Lord. You deserve the glory. We magnify your name. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we magnify your name. You deserve the glory.
You're high and lifted up in this house. We exalt you today, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, why don't you just wait on his presence for just the next moment or two? There's a divine appointment that's in this place right now for somebody. I don't want you to miss it today. Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. <laughs> God, you are great today. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. And I could search for all eternity through and find there is none like you. There is none like you. Search for all eternity through and Oh, there is no like you. Oh, yeah. There is none like you. Nobody else, no one else can touch my heart like you. Search 
like the way you feel tonight. There is none like you. Sing it one more time to him. Oh, there is none. There's nobody like you, Jesus. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I could search. I could search for all eternity through and find. Search for all eternity through and by there is none like you. There's nobody like you, Lord. There's nobody like you, Lord. We worship you and give you praise. We glorify you today. We exalt your name, oh God. You are high and lifted up, oh God. We glorify you. We glorify you today. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. If you believe that, why don't you give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now. Nobody like you, Jesus. Nobody else can touch me like you do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we worship you, Lord. We thank you today. Amen, amen, amen. I feel the presence of the Lord in this place tonight. Where Praise the Lord, everyone. Good to be here this evening and feel the presence of God like we're feeling it in this room. I expect God to do great things in this place. The Spirit's been flowing in this room since early pre-service prayer, and I'm just excited to have God here to back up His Word. Amen? Amen. I will say that it is good to have my wife and kids home. We traveled up to Canada to see uh, Jen, her sister. They were away for about 10 days, and it was about 10 days too long. <laughs> they say, you never know what you got until it's gone. I think I had a clue of what I had, but it left for 10 days, and I was miserable. But I'm glad that she's home, and I appreciate all that she does for our household. She's my best friend, so good to not be alone anymore, amen? I want to turn our attention to the book of Acts, chapter 2 and verse 44. The Bible says... And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had needed. We skip ahead a few chapters into Acts 4, verse 31. It says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that had believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness 
of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and with great grace was upon them. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of land or houses sold them, and bought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And I want to preach, teach, however it kind of comes out, this thought for the next few moments. For the kingdom. For the kingdom. God, I pray your spirit would flow in this room. God, I pray that there would be nothing that would stand in the way, God, of your will in this room. But I pray, oh God, your kingdom come and your will be done in this place just like it is in heaven. God, I pray that there would be a liberty in this house. And I pray, God, that your grace and mercy would be evident in this room. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated. The year was 1847. It was nearing the end of the Mexican-American War. There was a, a man by the name of Johann Sutter. And he started plans to lay out a new town near his fort. He was hoping to attract some of the expected hordes of American settlers who would stream through the passes of the Sierras. This town, it would need a lot of lumber, lots of lumber. So he decided that step one of building this settlement would to be building a sawmill. This sawmill would create profits needed to fund the new town, Sutterville. Sutter and his partner, James Marshall, found a perfect site for the mill in a place called Columba, about 45 miles from Sutter's Fort on the South Fork of the American River. Upon completion of the mill in January of 1848, they had set out to deepen the stream so that the mill race would have adequate power. On the morning of the 24th, James Marshall went down to inspect the progress of deepening the stream. And he later told the story, my eye was caught by something shining in the bottom of the ditch. Marshall reached down and grabbed a hold of it. He said, my heart, my, it made my heart thump, for I was certain that it was gold. And then I saw another. And for the next seven years, history records approximately 300,000 settlers flooded the area to what we know now as the California gold rush. You see, it was in this creek that a very vital mineral was found, a very valuable mineral was found. And we know that through history that creeks and streams and rivers, they carry quite a few minerals in them. We understand how a creek is formed. It's fed by a spring or a brook is formed, it's fed by a spring high up in a mountain somewhere, comes out of a crevice of a rock. And that water, as it comes out of that rock face, it erodes away that rock. And depending on what type of stone that is, granite or various other things, it will erode away the minerals that are lodged inside that rock. And a lot of times they hope that it's gold lodged inside that rock. And it'll, as it erodes that away, it'll carry small particles of these minerals downstream in hopes for some lucky settler, gold panner to find and strike it rich. We know that as water continues to flow downhill, it bends and turns around the Earth's surface, sometimes finding other rock faces, sometimes finding large ledges, creating waterfalls and pools at the bottom. Water will always follow the path of least resistance. And the flowing water is always constantly changing its course. A larger body of flowing water 
has the least amount of change in a rapid time. These are rivers that we know of today. And these rivers that we know today that travel our landscape, they are full of precious goods. These rivers can be full of minerals. These rivers can be full of life, fish, and other things that nature needs to survive and to carry on. And a lot of times in the early settlements, the settlers would dam up these rivers for various purposes, whether it would be to help the flow of water downstream for a settlement, or uh, as they advanced in technology, it would be to, to make a dam for power so they could feed power to their settlements. Or sometimes even it would just be flooding control. They would put various a series of dams in a river to control how much water could come down at one time to keep floods away from their cities and their towns. Dams, while they do have their benefits, they do have their downfalls as well. A dam blocking water can hinder the flow of life downstream. Not only uh, can it hinder the flow of minerals downstream, but it can hinder the flow of food and supplies, not just to us as, as mankind, but it can hinder the flow of food supplies to nature. We, we know that we're not the only things that eat fish. Bears and uh, various other animals, eagles and birds, they, they like to munch on fish too. They're tasty. I know I kind of jumped from a story to a story, but I'm going somewhere, so hang on. A few years ago, God showed me a dream, vision, daydream, what, whatever you want to call it. Just kind of like a picture, if you will, through my brain. And God showed me a river. He showed me that river flowing very free. And that river was very much full of life. In that river contained everything that you would need to survive. It contained resources of finance. It contained resources of health. It contained resources that are needed to sustain you in life. And as that river flowed, it turned here and there very naturally, just like a river would. <clears throat> and everywhere that that river turned, it left a deposit of goods. But then all of a sudden, in my seeing of this river, there appeared a dam in the river. And that, that river hit that dam, and it began to expand. And it began to get very large, like a lake or a pond. And eventually, all the goods that that river was carrying were stopped from going past the dam, stopped from going downstream and that that river became so big that the water began to spill out on the side somewhere up upstream before the dam and that that water that began to spill out of the side it chose a pass a path of least resistance and before you know it in my vision all the water had diverted around the dam and chose a different course. And then, as this water found a different course, a path of least resistance, everything that was behind the dam, this great lake or pond, if you will, dried up. And all that was left was dry ground and the dam. And God showed me in this vision that his kingdom was like this river. His kingdom flows very freely, very, very much wherever it needs to go, wherever it wants to go. It chooses a path of least resistance, for God is no respecter of persons, and he's not going to force himself upon you. And everywhere that that river turned, it was you and I. Everywhere that there was a fork in the river, it was one of us. And everywhere that turn was, one of us made a choice. I'm going to allow this river 
to flow through me or I'm going to damn it up and keep it to myself. And God showed me that where the dam was was like somebody who chose not to allow it to flow through them. And for a while, they were increased with goods. And for a while, life was prosperous for them. And for a while, they were getting fat and happy, if you will. But then that river chose a different path, a path of flowing, a path of movement, a path of advancement. And before you know it, this river that God said was his kingdom completely diverted around this individual who decided that I'm going to keep it to myself and not allow it to flow through me freely. I find an example of this in the book of Matthew. Excuse me one second. Matthew chapter 25, in verse number 14, it records a parable that Jesus taught to his disciples. It's a very uh, familiar parable, one that we probably all know. But the Bible says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling unto a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, and unto another two and to another one, and to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made the, them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two also gained another two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoned with them. And so he that had had received five talents came and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things, and I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And he also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. And the Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And when he had, he which had received the one talent came, said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou ha hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there hast thou is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sow not, and gathereth where I have not strawed. Thou wast therefore go to have put my money in exchangers, and then my coming, I should have received mine own with usury. And so he took the talent from the one and gave it to the other that had multiplied it. The people in the first text that I had read to you of the early church, they had a determination in their mind. And that determination was, we're going to do whatever it takes to advance the kingdom. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you need to sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you need to sell all your goods and distribute it evenly amongst us all and we can all be equal. I'm not going to preach that because I don't believe that's the will of the Lord currently. The early church had nothing. They started with nothing. And the purpose of them selling the goods and the purpose of distributing the goods was to get the church started. Today, the church is very healthy. The church is very much thriving. It does not need everything that we have to, to get off the ground. It's off the ground. It's moving. It's functioning. And it's, it's advancing forward. But their mindset, that's what I want to talk about tonight. It was a mindset of for the kingdom. Anything for the kingdom. 
It didn't matter. It didn't matter what I had. It didn't matter what I could obtain. It didn't matter what I had already obtained. It didn't matter uh, my success, my status. None of that mattered. The only thing that mattered to them was the advancement of the kingdom. And because it mattered so much to them that they were willing to do anything and everything to get this kingdom moving. They had the greatest example of all time that had walked before them, Jesus Christ, manifest in the flesh. And he gave everything that he had for the kingdom. And here they come, brand new converted. The book of Acts, the, the first uh, telling of this was in chapter 2, just after Peter preaches, and the Holy Ghost falls on them, and the Bible records about 3,000 souls added unto the church. And here they are, brand new, and they're just full of excitement, and they're full of energy, and they're just full of just so much faith that they can, that their faith was so big that they could say, God can do anything with what I have. So I'm just going to give everything that I have to God and just see what he does with it. And again, in Acts 4, another recording of a multitude that had been converted after great preaching. The Bible says that the Holy Ghost fell upon them. They were, they were brand new converts. They were excited. They had got a hold of something that changed their world. They got a hold of something that turned their world upside down. And they said, what are we going to do next? Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I want to see this thing get bigger and beyond me. I want to see this thing to, to, to expand out and to enlarge. And I'm just doing, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. I, I, I'm willing to just, you know, what do we need? Well, we need some land. What do we need? We need some money. What do we need? We need some workers. We need some laborers. Okay, this is what I've got. I've got land. I've got money. I, I've got workers. I've got servants. I've got this and that. Whatever you need, it's for the kingdom. It's for the kingdom. <clears throat> what is it that we can do today to advance the kingdom? How, how can I advance the kingdom? Why, why should I advance the kingdom? What benefit would it give me to have a mindset of whatever it takes, whatever I've got, God, it's yours. W what, what purpose would it bring for me to say, I'm just going to do whatever. God advance the kingdom. It's for the kingdom. Is there blessing in it? Is there favor in it? You better believe there is. You better believe there is. And I think, I think that there's a major difference between somebody that is blessed of God and somebody that has the favor of God. I think there's a difference. They're very similar, but I think there's a difference. You see, I believe that somebody that is blessed of God is somebody that is, the reason they're blessed is because God is bound by his word. The blessings of God are yes and amen. The, the blessings are God and are, are ask and you shall find, seek and it up. Uh, I'm sorry, ask and you shall be given, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be open. The blessings of God are give and it shall be given. Those are the blessings of God. They are binding to God. For God's word is forever settled in heaven and it will never return unto him void. So if you try God and you say, God, I'm, I'm going to put your word to practice. And, and you say, okay, I'm going to give. Okay, I'm, I'm going to knock. Okay, I'm going to ask. I'm going to seek. God is bound by his word to answer that, to answer that effort that you put towards him. But I also believe that the favor of God is not God be, uh, being bound by his word, but the favor of God is God choosing. God saying, okay, okay, you can have those blessings because I'm bound by my word, but I'm going to go above and beyond. I'm going to go above and beyond what my word says. I'm going to go, I'm, I'm going to do better than what you're, what, what you're trying to get out of me. I'm going to go beyond what my word has committed to you. And I'm going to grant you something above, exceedingly and above all that you can ask or think. That's the favor of God. There are many people 
There are many people in the Bible that had the favor of God on their life. What about Abram? You think Abram had the favor of God on his life? He's sitting there and he's blessed and he's happy and he's doing good. And God comes knocking on the door. Hey, Abram, I want you to get out of here. I want you to get away from your father's house. I want you to get away from your family. I want you to get away from all this good stuff that you've got going on. And let me tell you what I want you to do. I want you to just start walking. And I want you to walk really wherever you want. You tell me how much you want. You tell me how much you want me to give you. Because wherever you set your feet, guess what? I'm going to give you that land. Where, wherever you make camp, guess what? That's going to be yours now because I'm going to let you have it. You talk about some favor. God come down and he just said, okay, you've been blessed, but let me do you one better. And he does and he obeys God and he goes and he, is, he finds favor with God. He finds so much favor with God that God says, I'm going to do something, Abram. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow something to happen that's going to affect an entire community. I'm going to make something take place that's going to that's gonna affect an entire people and their existence. Because God comes by, he knocks on Abram's door. I, I think he's called Abraham now at this point. But he says, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to wipe Sodom and Gomorrah off the map. What do you think of that? What do I think? Uh, what do you mean, what do I think, right? You're God. I'm going to cause fire and brimstone to come down, and I'm going to wipe them right off the map. Abraham says, well, hold on a minute. He begins to bargain with God, and he, he alters God's original plan. You talk about some favor. But God comes by and knocks on your house. He says, I'm going to do something that, infect, that affects an entire nation. That was Moses. They had the, the, the children of Israel, they had done wrong, and they had chose to just turn away from God, and they had chose to just put God aside, and God, God takes Moses off in a little meeting, and he says, I'm just going to wipe the whole nation off the map. I'm going to flatten every last one of them. I'm going to wipe them off the face of the earth. I'm going to get rid of them. And I'm going to start over with you. And I'm going to let you have a great seed. And I'm going to let you have a great nation. And what does Moses do? He says, oh, hold on, God. Let's calm down for just a minute. Just Let's take a deep breath. Let's take a step back. Is that really what you want to do? Is that really how you want to present yourself to the Egyptians? You just brought this people out of the land of bondage. You just brought this people out of the land of slavery. And, and now you're saying you're going to wipe them off the map. How is that going to make you look, God? And the Bible says that God repented of his thoughts. God repented of his anger. That's some favor. That's some. Can you imagine, Brother Channel? God come by your house. Oh, Brother Channel, guess what? I'm going to let so-and-so be the next president. <laughs> Come on. And you and God have a discussion. Oh, Brother Channel, guess what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow, I'm gonna allow the Taliban to have control over Afghanistan. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the conversation that you would have with God? Can you imagine what it would be like? To have that much favor. See, old Moses, he, he did even one better than that. Moses jumped an entire dispensation. That's right. Moses, God gave Moses the law, and we had the dispensation of law because God's law was now evident on earth. And God's law said, God's word that was binding said, the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement is going to have to do such and such and such and such. They're going to have to have a sacrifice. They're going to have to burn that sacrifice on the altar. He's going to have to come into the, the place of washing, the, uh, the labor, and he's going to have to wash. And then he's going to have to go into the, the 
the holy place, not the holies of holies yet, because he's still got some work to do. And he's got to go into the, the altar of incense. He's got to take the coals from the fire of the sacrifice, and he's got to mix it with the incense, and he's got to let that sweet aroma go up in the room. And there's all these workings he's got to do. And then on the Day of Atonement, He's got to go into the holies of holies behind the veil where the Ark of the Covenant was. And guess what, Moses? If he's got sin in his heart or if he missed his death or if he did something wrong, when he steps behind that veil, I'm going to kill him. That's what the law said. That's what the binding word of God said. This person has to be anointed by the high, to be anointed to be the high priest, and he has to go all through all these steps just to get into my presence. And the thunderings and the clouds were on top of the mountain, and Moses walks up on top of that mountain and says, "Hey God, what's up?" Never once anointed to be a high priest. Never once did all the processings and the workings of the inner tabernacle. And he went more than once a year. And it wasn't just on a day of atonement. And he walked right into the presence of God. And he said, God, what's going on? What are we doing today? You talk about some favor. He bypassed an entire dispensation. He bypassed an entire law that was given to God because he was a friend of God. Because he had some favor of God upon his life. You, you talk about some favor with God. He says, okay, I want you to be, I want you up here. I want you where I am. What about Enoch? I think I got that right. He was translated, right? The Bible says that he, he didn't die. I think I got that name right. Just came in my brain like that. Okay? God said, I'm not going to let you see death. I'm just going to bring you up. Boom. Here you go. That's some favor. That that's some power of a kingdom. That's some power of an almighty God evident on earth. So what is it? My Lord, time went right by. <laughs> what is it? What is this favor? And what, how can it benefit me? How can it be good for me? Well, that's just the point. It's not about you. It's, it's the kingdom of God is bigger than us. The kingdom of God is beyond us. And the way that you have the favor and the way that you allow it to flow through you is you don't make it about you, but you make it about the kingdom. Because, see, a life that is devoted to the kingdom, a life that is devoted to allowing the kingdom to flow through it. It's a life that has unlimited resources flowing through it. It's a life that has unlimited finances flowing through it. Well, how can you say that? Well, because God's word is binding. And it says that I own a cattle on a thousand hills. All the silver and gold, it's his. And if you allow God to flow through you in a financial way, you have unlocked an unlimited source of finances. You might not believe me yet. But let me just tell you. I don't have much. But I have more than enough to survive. And I can tell you as a personal testament, you cannot outgive God. You can't do it. I, I'm telling you as a personal testimony, I have given and I have given and we have given pretty good and we've been really faithful in our giving. Pastor can testify to that. He knows all the things that we've been doing. And I'm telling you that you cannot outgive God. When you allow finances of the kingdom, when, when you say, okay, God, let me pause for just one moment. When you get a mindset of for the kingdom, you get a mindset of this is not my money. This is God's money. When you get a mindset of the kingdom, this is not my house. This is God's house. This is not my car. This is God's car. This is not my family. This is God's family. This is not my job. This is God's job. 
This is not my health crisis. This is God's health crisis. And let me, ha let me tell you what happens when you say it's not mine, it's God's. What happens is you say, okay, God, here's the money that you've given to me. What do you want me to do with it? And God says, put it here. Okay, you pass the test. God, this is your money. What do you want me to do with it? God says, put it here. Okay, you pass the test. Okay, God, this is your money. What do you want me to do with it? Oh, hold on one second. Here's a lot more, and I need you to move it over here too because I've trusted you to move $100, and I've trusted you to move $1,000. Now I've trusted you to move $26,000, and the next time I'm going to trust you to move $100,000, and the next time I'm going to trust you to move a million dollars, and the next time I'm going to trust you to move a billion dollars. Oh, come on, folks. It's not out of reach. This is the kingdom, and it's unlimited. This is God's car, and let me tell you, God doesn't drive a broken-down car. <laughs> God doesn't drive a car that falls apart every time you turn it on. For when, when you get this mindset of, it's not mine, it's for the kingdom. It's not mine, it's for God. You, you unlock the kingdom of heaven to whatever you apply that to. This isn't my health crisis. Okay, you're going to have peace when you go to Boston and Lexi has a brain tumor removed from you. I'm going to give you a peace that passes all understanding before you even know it's a tumor. You just know something's wrong, but let me just tell you, I'm going to put a peace in that hospital room that is so tangible that you can grab a hold of it, something that you've never felt before. And that peace is going to go with you on the airplane all the way down into Boston. And that peace is going to stay behind a little bit with your husband when he drives down to Boston in anxiety. And, and, and I'm not going to allow that that worry and that fear to get a hold of you and it's going to carry you the whole week while you're in Boston and it's going to stay with you and it's going to rest upon you and I'm going to carry you through it. Why? Because I have a purpose to this medical emergency. I have a purpose to what's going on in your life and if you would just say, okay God, whatever I face, okay God, whatever I'm up against, okay God, whatever you put in my lap, okay God, whatever you put on me, it's for the kingdom. It's not for me, God. It's not for me to be successful. It's not for me to be a advanced. But God, it's for your kingdom. It's for your kingdom to advance. It's for souls to be saved. It's to be a testimony and a witness to a dying and dark world. It's for the kingdom. Go ahead and ask Obed-Edom what happened. When God's favor set upon his house for a little while. Right. <laughs> Go ahead and ask him. You might say to yourself, you know, anybody, anybody could have been that person to find that first nugget of gold. But think on it this way. I say not anybody would have found that gold. Because the whole reason he found that gold, Brother Channel was because he said, I got a vision. I've got a plan. What's it going to take to put that plan together? Well, we're going to need a sawmill. We're going to have a town. We've got to have this. And so they began to get some settlers, and they began to get to, to work, and they began to get their hands dirty, and they began to do. And they, they, they weren't sitting still. They weren't sitting by. They were go-getters. They were doing something. They were advancing something. They had a vision. They had a goal to obtain. And if they never had those goals, if they never had that vision, if they never had that, that want to, that drive, they would have never been in that creek bed. They would have never been there digging. There never would have been a sawmill. So I say that it had to be them. It had to be them. We could stand all over this house. I hope that I have sparked something on the inside of you. I hope that I've unlocked maybe just a little bit of a revelation on the inside of you. Folks, we have got to be about the kingdom. We have got to be about advancing the kingdom. Yeah. I'm not saying that you got to give up all your hopes and your dreams. I'm not saying that you got to give up everything that you've ever imagined. I'm not saying you got to empty your bank account to, to advance the kingdom. If God tells you to, be obedient because I'm telling you when you do, there's a, there's a whole nother a, a, a movement coming. There's a whole nother wave of it coming because you cannot outgive God. 
But I wonder if all across this house, I don't know, you probably just, for right now, stay where you are. Because I don't, I don't want to, to call anybody out. I don't want to, to, to make a spectacle of anybody. But I wonder if all over this house, if we could make a fresh, fresh consecration to God and say, you know what, God? I've been given here, but maybe I didn't give up my talent. Maybe I didn't give up my time like I should. Maybe I'm not giving up my finances like I should or like I could. Maybe it's not even about what you should do. Maybe it's about what you could do. Maybe you, maybe you got two coats, friend, and you can just give it to somebody who doesn't have one. I was, uh, I was at work a while back. And we had just gone to the scrap yard. We like to turn in metals. We, we buy like waters and ice cream and stuff like that at work with the, the money that we get for the scrap metal. And we had just gone to the scrap yard and we got $20. Not much, 20 bucks. And so after returning back to the office, we had the uh, shopping carts that we returned to Shaw's because our tenants always take the Shaw's shopping carts and so we always bring them back. And we're in the truck, me and my boss, and there's a, there's a man sitting on this staircase by Shaw's uh, because the parking lot is down. There's like a little staircase that takes you up to the sidewalk. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, we should give that guy the $20. I didn't really say nothing. We were just driving. My boss had the money, and he was driving. And I'm not going to yell out, stop, wait a minute. The Holy Ghost spoke to me. You know, he don't believe like, like I believe. So I don't think I'm whatever. So... Not even a second goes by. And he looks at me and says, we should give that guy the $20. I said, you know what? <laughs> God just told me the same thing. You must be hearing voices. We thought that was funny. But anyway, so we stopped. Backed up a little bit. My boss jumps out and uh, says to the guy, hey, you know, I, I don't want to embarrass you or whatever, but I just, I just, we, we wanted to give you this, some, something, you know, whatever. And this, this guy says, oh, yeah, you know, sure, whatever, man, what you got, $100, $50? It's kind of like, well, man, <laughs> no, oh, yeah, it's 20 Sorry, to kind of be disappointing, you know? So he, he hand, my boss hands it to the guy, and he was eating some food, and he got some of the sauce or whatever. He's dipping his fries in on my boss's hand. He was all grossed out, you know, whatever. And, and he, he get back in the truck, and he's just like, man, like, what in the world? Like, what's wrong with people? You know what I mean? And, and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, what is wrong with people? Like, come on, man. Like, what's wrong with you? But then a thought crossed my mind. What if one of those guys was an angel one time? You hear stories about it, right? You think, yeah, right, would ever be in my lifetime. Yeah, right, an angel would be rude to you. They probably would, just to test you, right? It's about the kingdom, folks. It's about what you do when nobody's looking. It's about what you do when nobody else knows about it. It's about what you do when you're in a strange place. What are you doing with what God has given to you already? Are you keeping it to yourself? Are you saying, this is going to be for my benefit? This is going to be to help me be better? Or is your mindset saying, okay, God, this is what you've given me. How can I put it to work? How can I put it to use? How can I advance your kingdom? All over this house, I wonder if we could just make a fresh consecration. God, whatever you put in my hands, I'm going to use it for your kingdom. God, whatever you put in my hands, I'm going to use it to advance your kingdom. It's always been 
Center of it all at the center of it all at the center of 